Good afternoon and welcome to the June version of our monthly webinars related to the Rapid Trans Downtown Ra Rochester Rapid Transit Project. Um, many of you have been with me for the last six, seven, eight months now doing this monthly and talking through several of the uh, issues and, and, and progress that we've been having on, on downtown rapid transit. Today's webinar is focused in, and, and we're gonna start to talk about the, env the environmental review process. I won't dive too deep on in because we're gonna spend a little time diving deeper into why and, and where, where this environmental process is moving forward. Uh, let's uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, in general, uh, I will go through uh, some, some project background and, and, and where we sit with the project a little bit. And then we'll talk more generally about the environmental process that is required by the, the federal, by the feds and the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, sorry for that acronym. Uh, and then we'll start to take a look at uh, the elements that's part of, that's part of the environmental process. And, and then we, uh, and with, with some early thoughts and, and signs of how, um, where, where we're going with the environmental process. And of course, we'll take um, a couple, next slide, we'll take a couple of uh, pauses through the presentation to answer questions. Um, and just a reminder, there's two ways you can ask your questions. Uh, the first will be by the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please go ahead and submit your questions that way. And we will, uh, during our pauses, we will def definitely try to answer uh, most, if not all those questions that we can. We will occasionally, if we get a lot of questions, start responding to several of those questions uh, directly in, in the, the Q&A box so that we, so we don't get backlogged. Um, during, the, during those pauses, during the presentation, you are invited to uh, raise your hand and our master webinar uh, uh, producer behind the scenes, Alicia, We'll be gladly, uh, we will uh, signify that you're ready to speak. We will unmute, allow you to unmute your mic. You need to unmute your mic and you can ask your questions live during those open sessions. So with that, let's get going on into the, 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 the basics that many of us have seen before. Uh, downtown Rapid Transit has been around for roughly about a decade now, started with the downtown, uh, the original downtown master plan back in 2010 but really got kicked off in, in 2014, 2015 with the DMC development plan uh, and, and has moved pretty quickly since then uh, through uh, the transit development plan and uh, the city's 20, uh, 2020, uh, the 2040 uh, comprehensive plan. Um, uh, the image that you see in front of you was some work completed last year in which uh, we took a little time to, instead of just focusing on the transit element itself, we took some time to look at the land use and how we can uh, how the land use in, affects transit and vice versa. Transit affect, and, and affects uh, land use and and to see how how those two and, and how this downtown rapid transit corridor could, could develop. Next slide. So all of those documents kind of uh, came out with the projection that we are expecting a lot of growth, uh, not only in, in all of Rochester but particularly downtown, up to thirty thousand new employee. Em employees downtown uh, by 2040 and with an additional uh, 15, 10, uh, about roughly 15,000 new residents, even just downtown. So with all that growth coming out of projected in those plans, uh, th those documents pointed out, we'll have some serious congestion issues downtown. Uh, if we continued our, our traditional patterns, uh, development patterns, we would add several new uh, blocks of just parking garages to accommodate all everyone driving their own vehicles downtown. And then with all of that happening, we would see a, a, a diminishing quality of life for, for residents, employees, and visitors. So that has led us to create what's known as our mode shift targets. Uh, essentially in 2015, we had roughly 70% of all people that come downtown for work or for visits uh, driving their own personal vehicles. We'd like to see that number reduced to roughly about 40% by 2040 with an increase in all other modes of transportation getting downtown. And that includes uh, a jump from 10% to 30% in, in transit and downtown rapid transit is a core element of that growth. Next slide. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to provide an ex uh, a superior passenger experience through down downtown rapid transit it, we improve capacity and frequency of the transit system uh, in, in through downtown 
and con continue to work on that those commuter mode shift goals that you just saw. But I should take a, take a second here and make an, make an important point that downtown rapid transit is just one element of trying to address the, the growth that we are expecting downtown. Included with that includes uh, parking policies that the city has developed over the last several years, um, work on bicycle and pedestrian ways to get downtown and in downtown with such projects as City Loop. We also have what's known as a trans Travel Demand Management Association, and that is a group that helps to promote uh, the use of transit and other modes of getting downtown as well and, and helps track uh, some of our numbers as it relates to uh, commuter traffic. And then finally, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, no, no solution would be complete without the change in land use and zoning goals uh, in the corridor to help support transit and, um, and, and this new way of uh, trying to get everyone downtown. Next slide. So what are the benefits of downtown bus rapid transit or BRT for short? long-term investment in, in a sustainable transportation. Uh, we're, we're hoping to utilize 60 foot electric bus, buses to help with that sustain, sustainable uh, goals. We're looking for high quality stations and buses that help convey a permanence to the system uh, that will be around for a lot, very long time. And that include, that what that helps do is help to, helps communicate to developers within downtown and within the corridor that uh, that that the, this rapid that rapid transit is a is a long term and will help assist their development as well. And of course, we're looking for uh, to increase the different uh, the, the the service levels offered by Rochester Public Transit RPT, um, and that would be. Uh, Rochester Rapid Transit will help with faster service with more capacity, uh, getting people into downtown. Next slide. So let's take a look at the service itself. Uh, right now, it's proposed to be roughly a, a 2.6 mile bus rapid transit line or BRT for short, it includes seven stations. We'll take a look at the map here in a second, but then it's 11 platforms. We are proposing to utilize what are known as transit pr preference lanes, or business access in transit lanes, or BAT, or BAT for short lanes, that those lanes will have a preference to have the transit vehicles in those lanes, but people in the person vehicles will still be able to make right-hand turns out of those lanes into uh, side streets and to accesses along Second Street. The project also includes a new transit center at St. Mary's that would include a pedestrian tunnel underneath Second Street. As part of that uh, Second Street work, we also are looking at doing a total reconstruction of Second Street between 11th to 16th Avenues. And as I mentioned a second ago, we're looking at purchasing 11 electric vehicles, uh, 60 foot long uh, electric vehicles. Next slide. General at service, uh, if you arrive at one of our seven stations, a bus would arrive every five minutes during the morning and evening peaks during the week and roughly 10 to 15 minutes during off peak and on the weekends. It'll take roughly 15 minutes to get from one end to the other. And like I said, we'll take a look at a map here in a second. We're expecting 11,000 riders the day we open in 2025. And, we're, and we hope to, to offer expanded service hours that, that, that are not traditional Rochester public transit hours, which includes with the thought of five to 11 uh, during the weekday. Next slide. Let's take a quick look here at the map. Um, it starts on the west side or the west side of town with what is currently Mayo's West parking lot. We hope to, the city hopes to turn that into the West Transit Village. And that, that would include a, a multi-use, um, so it'd be more than just parking. It would also include residential and commercial um, facilities out at that facility near Cascade Lake. Moving towards the east, the, the line would then run through downtown by St. Mary's and through downtown, eventually hitting Civic Center and then hit, uh, make then make a right-hand turn onto 3rd Street or 3rd Avenue, excuse me, 3rd Avenue, then make a right-hand turn onto 4th Street uh, and, and with a stop at the Government Center, another right-hand turn on the Broadway with a left-hand turn back on the 2nd Street to head back out west. With that, I'll take a pause to see if we have any questions that have come on in. And this is your opportunity to once again, if you have any general questions about the system and, and, and its operations, please go ahead. Uh, you can do that uh, by, by submitting a question via the chat or the Q&A box, excuse me. 
or um, by raising your hand at the moment and we will un, uh, go through a process to unmute your mic. And we have one person that's raised their hand. Uh, Barry, um, looks like, uh, Alicia, if you could unmute Barry. Yep, you now have the power to unmute your uh, mic, Barry. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, I have a question. I know we've talked about how the, uh, the goals um, uh, that, that it's because of the growing population. I'm just wondering if there's anyone on staff who will amend the goals as time goes on because population is not really static. I'm just wondering if there's somebody on staff so we don't have to go out to a consultant who will update and amend the different models. Because as you've seen, like even with Mayo Clinic, we don't really know exactly how many employees they're gonna have downtown, if it'll expand or contract. So I'm just wondering if there's, again, somebody on staff who, who will be able to amend this model, because the model is about now four years old, probably. So I'm just wondering, again, is there someone there who will actually modify that as time goes on? Well, I can say, I can respond in a couple of different ways. First, I would say, yes, the staff, the staff, the city staff is very much interested in the results coming out of the, as you just know, we, we just had a 2020 census. We just had our 10 year census taken. And so we're very interested in those results and, and that will help uh, see where we are on the track for that modeling or for the growth that we're expecting in town. Um, as part of that um, reminder that, uh, Rochester Public Transit, RPT, is currently uh, conducting uh, their, their 10, or their, their actually their 20 year plan, which is done every five years, it's known as the transit development plan. So I'm sure we'll take another quick look um, uh, into those projections again here this year. And reminder that the DMC plan uh, was redone last year um, and they took a look at the, um, at the, at, at the growth as well. Um, and so far, everything that we, we've seen so far has is, is is been showing that we're on path to see that large increase in, in, in growth that we're expecting. Uh, let me try to take a second here to um, answer a few of the questions uh, that have come on in. The first one that I see uh, typed up was um, the money for the buses. Uh, do we have the money? Well, let's talk, let's talk uh, generally about the, how we're going to uh, fund the project. The project will be funded by 49% Federal Transit Administration or FTA funds. And then the rest would be uh, roughly 50% uh, roughly of the project, or maybe even more, 50.5% 50, 50, 50 of the project will be funded with Destination Medical Center uh, transit funds uh, that we've already started accumulating through the DMC initiative and its effort. Uh, the last little bit um, of, of, the, of the funding system will be paid for by uh, some, some local funds, particularly as it relates to the reconstruction of Second Street. And, and so, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the buses uh, right now, I mean, are estimated about 1.5 million each, uh, actually just lower than that, because um, Rochester, Rochester Public Transit is, is in the process of purchasing two similar 60-foot uh, electric buses at the current moment, or, uh, or yeah, finishing, finalizing that process. So yes, uh, the, the money will be paid for by those two sources, federal and DMC funds. Uh, eminent a question about eminent domain. Um, we only anticipate one purchase of, of a property um, and that is for the St. Mary's Transit Center. Um, so, and that would be the Cafe Presto uh, facility across the street from St. Mary's. Um, we hope to not utilize, and, and, and as many of you know, and been with the city council for a long time, has a strong aversion to eminent domain. Uh, so we've already reached out and, and uh, we can't start the process and negotiations uh, because of this environmental process that we'll talk about here in a second, um, but we've already reached out to the landowners and been in conversations with them. Uh, well, the reconstruction street uh, required a relocation of businesses. Once again, the only relocation uh, that's planned or, or real taking a property or looking at, at trying to use property is that Cafe Presto um, facility. All other, um, uh, there'll be pretty minor or particularly just construction impacts uh, through the process. With that, um, I will pass it off, pass off to, uh, uh, looks like Jessica, Je I thought it was gonna be Adele, but to, <laughs> Jessica, to Jessica Labs who will, uh, Take Tucky's through and give us a, a primary of the environmental process. Jessica. All right, thanks, Jarrett. Um, so yes, we I will just be giving an, an overview of environmental process and where we're at. 
And again, my name is Jessica Lobbs. I'm, I'm with Kimley Horn on the consultant team um, supporting the city uh, on this effort. And I'm leading the environmental the preparation of the environmental document. So excited to share a few things with you today. So first we just start with the foundation of why we have to do an environmental document. Uh, and that's really dictated by the National Environmental Policy Act or what we call NEPA. So this is NEPA is the primary law that governs the environmental review process. And this is specifically triggered by use of federal dollars uh, for a project and or um, the necessity of a federal permit. Um, so if, if there's a federal agency permit that needs to be um, provided for a project that would also trigger NEPA. So what NEPA is, is, is really a set of regulations and a, a path forward uh, in decision-making that agencies has to go, have to go through uh, to study the environmental impacts of a proposed project. And this, is, this can be very small projects to very large projects. Again, if they have federal funding, um, usually some type of NEPA environmental document is required. So for the Rochester um, Rapid Transit Project, because federal funding, as Jarrett mentioned, uh, will be coming from the Federal Transit Administration, um, we, FTA is then the lead federal agency for the project, uh, and the city, uh, along with FTA, is required to prepare an environmental document to comply with NEPA. So under NEPA, uh, based on the, the size of the project and, and the anticipated impacts, there are three levels of environmental review or three types of environmental documents that could be prepared. These are called classes of action. Uh, and they range from categorical exclusions uh, to environmental impact statements and basically goes from low level impact to high level impact. So for a categorical exclusion, um, this type of document is prepared for a project that doesn't, uh, is not anticipated to have significant impacts uh, to the human and natural environment. Uh, an environmental assessment would be a step above that where maybe we're not really sure um, on the level of significance of different types of impact. So we need to do a little bit more analysis or have a little bit more agency involvement uh, in that assessment or an environmental impact statement is one that we know is a larger project is probably gonna have some, some more significant effects. Um, so for Rochester um, Rapid Transit, uh, we worked with the FTA to figure out the class of action and they determined that a categorical exclusion uh, is um, the level of documentation that, that we should prepare. We can go to the next slide. So this is a summary of what's, what's required to be part of a categorical exclusion. So basically we're, we're completing a document to verify that FTA is correct in their assumption that the project will not result in significant impacts uh, to the human or natural environment. The biggest difference um, between a categorical exclusion and maybe a, an environmental assessment that you may also be familiar with is that for a categorical exclusion, there's no formal public review that's required. Um, and then we also don't need to compare this proposed project to like a no build alternative or really investigate other alternatives in the environmental document. Uh, for, a, for a categorical exclusion, we pretty much, we know what the alignment is and the mode, we, we understand what the project definition is and that's what we carry forward into the document. The same types of topics are covered in each, and you see a list of them here. Um, and I'm gonna just walk through next where we're at in the assessment of these different topics. Um, so Alicia, you can go to the next slide. And I just wanna say here too, that these are preliminary findings. So we have a draft categorical exclusion prepared um, for the project, working really closely with the engineering team and with the city. Um, but this, our document has not been reviewed by uh, the Federal Transit Administration or, or other agencies yet, um, because there are still some engineering elements that are being worked out 
that we want to make sure we have that uh, full definition in our captured in our document. So what I'm going to share with you today is preliminary findings, and we're happy to take um, questions on those too. So we're going to walk through uh, each of these different issue areas um, and kind of what we look at and, and sort of what we're seeing with um, implementation of Rochester Rapid Transit. So for land use and zoning, the question we need to answer is, is if the project is consistent with current land uses and planned land uses um, in the corridor. And so we, we take a look at city plans, regional plans, that sort of thing. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that the project is consistent and, and Jarrett covered some of those plans and goals uh, earlier in this presentation. We have conducted a traffic analysis uh, and have found so far um, that with the proposed design of the, the project, operations particularly on 2nd Street and in downtown would be similar or improved compared to uh, what they are today or what they would be in the future without the project. So we, we compare the impact, what we think the impacts would be of this project to um, you know, what would happen if we didn't do anything? That's what's called the no-build alternative. And so um, with the increasing population and then the increasing congestion, um, we're actually seeing that implementation of the transit project would help uh, traffic operations in downtown and on second, or certainly will not make it worse. Um, we, we also look at short-term impacts or impacts during construction when we consider each of these issues. Uh, so uh, there will be short-term impacts to traffic uh, with construction of bus rapid transit. Uh, that would include you know, standard lane intersection <clears throat> closures and detours. Uh, and as de design advances there, um, a maintenance of traffic plan, so a specific plan for how traffic will be handled during construction will be prepared. Air quality is another um, factor that we consider in the environmental document. This project area and Rochester is in what, what we call attainment uh, for national ambient air quality standards. We compare to uh, data from the Environmental Protection Agency um, for air quality standards in, in any metro area. And one thing to note here is, you know, Jarrett mentioned electric buses are part of this proposed uh, transit project. Um, that really helps in a lot of elements um, that would fall under that sustainability goal, um, but also for air quality, um, because we are using electric buses it's highly unlikely that we're gonna see any negative impact on air quality. So here, this slide has historic resources and visual quality. Um, the study of historic resources are governed by a separate parallel federal process called section 106. And that refers to a specific section of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, so we are working alongside a team that is looking into the historic resources in the corridor. Um, that, so that consultation is ongoing and the Federal Transit Administration is also very involved in that. Right now, that work is focused on identifying historic properties in the corridor. So we look at two different things when we're talking about historic resources and what I call the, the above ground, which is the architecture or, or the buildings um, and, and groups of buildings that might be a district. And then the below ground, which is the archeology. span So the things that may be buried um, beneath the project area. So what, what has been found so far in the investigation of the area is there's pretty low potential uh, for this project area or the area of potential effect to, to have any historically significant or um, things that actually remain intact and still have integrity 
um, in terms of archaeology. So there's really no more work or investigation planned uh, on the below ground side of things. For structures or the above ground, uh, a full inventory or survey was done um, of the corridor and an area surrounding it uh, to uh, record what is already listed on the National Register of Historic Places and to also consider the age and condition of buildings and, and determine if they may be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And that's important because anything that's listed on that, uh, on the National Register or, or could be eligible for it, uh, then requires an analysis to, to see if the project would have any effects. And if those effects would be adverse, then we need to figure out if there are mitigation measures that we need to uh, employ. So just a note too, because I understand there hasn't been a webinar on this uh, Section 106 topic specifically, um, but there are a number of other parties that are involved in this consultation. They're called consulting parties. Um, and those include, uh, in, in addition to the State Historic Preservation Office, um, the Olmsted County Historical Society, um, the Rochester uh, Historical Organization, um, and also the Mayo Clinic. So there are parties involved in that process. Um, for visual quality, really what, what we anticipate here is pretty minor visual changes and those are mostly gonna be associated with the new stations um, and areas where there may be dedicated right away, which again, it's just, it's not that much different than the visual context that exists today, um, but it is gonna be a little bit of a change. And wanted to note here too, that the city um, has undertaken a pretty intense community engagement process to help design the station areas and really reflect the priorities of the Rochester community and, and what is desired by, by stakeholders. So that will continue through the design process. Next slide. Noise and vibration. Uh, again, when we're talking about rubber tired vehicles and electric vehicles, really noise and vibration are not anticipated to be a concern. So we did assess the existing noise in the area and then added the operation of bus rapid transit on that and are not seeing noise impacts as a result of the project. Um, same with vibration, everything falls underneath or, or below um, any thresholds that the FTA sets uh, for level of impact. There will be standard um, noise and vibration um, impacts during construction. So there will also be a construction mitigation plan um, developed and we'll make sure that we are um, conducting those activities to help minimize that impact during the construction period. Um, acquisitions and relocations, we covered a bit, and then hazardous materials. So Jarrett mentioned that the Cafe Presto site is the one full parcel acquisition that we have, and that's on Second Street across from St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, the project would also need to acquire some smaller slivers of land, we call them, around each station. Um, where we just can't maybe quite fit within the existing right away, there may just be a small band that we need around those. Um, but uh, the appropriate process will, will be conducted with the property owners on that. And just to reiterate, no residential displacements are required for the project. Hazardous materials. So similar to any more urban corridor, uh, existing contamination does exist below ground. Um, so if we are anticipating any activities that really are gonna move a significant amount of soil, um, we would be proposing um, that additional monitoring and investigation is done at those sites. 
So we'll continue to coordinate with the engineering team on, on level of excavation and, and if any of those um, known contaminated sites would need to be addressed. Okay, so we kind of talked more about some of the physical impacts of the project. Now we'll talk about some more on the social side. So we are required to look at how the project might impact or disrupt the community itself and specific features of the community. Um, we also take a look at what community facilities or resources exist in the corridor and if we're having any um, impacts to those facilities. So the assessment thus far doesn't um, show any adverse to community resources, adverse effects to community resources. Um, and actually by implementing BRT here, um, access to the community facilities and different destinations in the corridor um, would be improved um, by creating a better way for people to travel between those and get to those resources. Environmental justice um, is a topic that is required um, in any project with federal funding for us to take a look at how or if the project um, would have any disproportionately high and adverse effects on minority populations or low income populations. So we start by identifying those populations in a project area, see if they exist and to what level. Um, and it, uh, residents in this project area are more racially diverse um, and do have a lower income than the average Olmstead County resident. So we, we compare often to citywide or countywide data to see how our project areas compare. Um, but again, no, um, and when we have minimal impacts on the project anyway, but those where those impacts occur, they are not disproportionate, um, disproportionately occurring in areas with minority or low income populations. And um, actually we see a benefit here uh, to environmental justice communities by having a better transit service and expanding opportunities um, for those who may also uh, not have a car or are more transit reliant for their transportation needs. Next. Okay, now with some of the more um, true environmental type impacts that you might expect. Uh, so we are required to see if there are any federal or state um, protected species in the project area. So at this point, the data we have is for all of Olmstead County. And we're in the process of coordinating with the US Fish and Wildlife Service on federal species and then the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources on state um, to determine what's actually present in our specific project area. But at this point, uh, what we know is that in the county, so potentially available in this corridor, uh, there are four federally listed species, and those are um, the northern long-eared bat, which shows up on pretty much any project in Minnesota, that there is potential um, that the species could be present, and then the rusty patched bumblebee, which again is, is pretty much showing up on a lot of Minnesota projects. And then there are two um, plant species. So what I can say about that is, I mean, this again, being an urban corridor, the likelihood of us having suitable habitat for any of these species is probably pretty slim, but we, we wanna confirm that with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're in the process of that. The six um, state listed species include four aquatic species in Olmstead County. Again, so that's probably not something we're gonna have to worry about for this project. Uh, one plant, and then one animal, which is the peregrine falcon. Um, and I can tell you that peregrine falcons do sometimes exist in urban areas. They like to nest on tall buildings sometimes. So we will be um, seeing if any of that activity exists in our project area. And if so, uh, there will be mitigation measures that we'll need to follow. 
For water resources, as you might expect in an urban environment, um, we're not anticipated to impact wetlands, floodplains, or water quality. There are some um, parks and trails within the study area. Uh, and for that, we, we need to uh, review impacts um, according to another federal piece of legislation, which is called Section 4F. So if we end up having any impacts on any of these recreation areas, um, there are some steps we need to go through to coordinate with the officials that, that have governance over those resources. Um, right now, we, we expect that if anything, those, those impacts would be pretty small um, in nature. Next slide. And then finally, um, another element that, that we always look at with the transit project is relative to safety and security. So implementing BRT in this corridor would be pretty similar to other um, bus lines already operating. And we're not an anticipating um, introducing any new or different safety hazards or security concerns. Um, in fact, with BRT, there's a little bit maybe higher level of amenity. So these stations would have wheelchair AD, ADA ramps, um, lighting, security systems, and information displays um, that all contribute to traveler safety and security. Uh, and then just worth noting too, that on these BRT platforms, there is a warning strip that's installed uh, at the edge um, to warn pedestrians about the change between the platform and the pavement to warn them of that step. Um, so no, no adverse uh, impacts relative to safety and security are anticipated. So that is a very, that's a lot of information. Um, and a broad overview of, of impacts. And I see we have some questions coming in, but I think we're gonna hold those till the end, right, Adele? Or are no, we no, taking think, them now? I, no, we, we got, we can, we have time. We can go ahead okay. and, and try to address those. Um, uh, let's see, I'll give you, I'll give you a second here to, to read them, Jessica, because you're, yeah. you're probably the best person to answer most of these. Um, shoot, there was something, uh, Alicia, can you go scroll back to the, the previous slide? There was something I was gonna say. Um, on that while well, I give Jessica a second. Uh, yes, uh, oh, yes, yes. So this slide uh, talks about the, the, the stations. Um, and I just wanted to make, point out that last month's webinar, uh, the, the, the May webinar was focused in on that very detailed station design. Uh, so you can find the recording of those webinars uh, on, our, on our webpage, uh, www. Uh, uh, rochestermm.gov backslash rapid transit um, to get to, to find those, um, uh, to find out, to see the webinar and find out more information on the stations. All right, uh, Jessica, the first question, uh, what's the types of con contamination we might see in this corridor? Uh, sure, and I'm just um, pulling up our documentation here. I think uh, what, we, what we saw in, in the assessment, so a, a limited phase one, environmental site assessment was done uh, for the corridor and the area within 500 feet of the project center line. So we, we have a broader area to account for anything, you know, liquid or contaminants travel underground, depending on the grades and such. So we, we study a broader area. Uh, what we're seeing here is pretty consistent with what we would see in an urban area. So um, maybe some, let's see, abandoned fuel tanks, um, fill soils that might include some demolition debris or something like that, um, that could be a potential contaminant. I would also add that these are pretty conservative um, where they may um, result in contamination, but it's not um, for certain on all of these. And then there is one uh, groundwater plume that was identified in the project area um, that, let's see, is maybe a little, it looks like a little bit of petroleum groundwater contamination. So that's just something that 
we don't anticipate disturbing as part of the project, but it's good to know where things are um, relative to where we might be working. Thank you, Jessica. Next, next question, uh, impact to deer. Yeah, so um, we know deer can be anywhere, right? Um, I would say, I mean, deer are not a protected species, but there are considerations for um, common wildlife like deer, squirrels, rabbits, and such. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate any, any more impact than already uh, might exist or risk that might exist just from, you know, cars traveling on a roadway. Um, we're not going to be adding a lot more risk here to deer or other common wildlife. This, this next question, Jessica, is, is a little uh, is a little deeper, and I kind of kind of like the question a little bit here. It uh, it's asking that, that it's the question pretty much states that yes, we are going to, we're looking at environmental justice and looking at uh, uh, low income individuals and people of uh, different uh, race and creeds and backgrounds, but and a BIPOC population, but um, what about, uh, but uh, a question about looking at the uh, disproportionate benefit um, for wealthier neighbors. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I am aware of that Houston work and it's sort of an interesting uh, take or an interesting uh, approach to environmental justice. Um, right now, I mean, we, di we didn't look at that or take that approach, um, and, and it's not required um, by federal requirements, but that's certainly something we can, we can think about a little bit more. I appreciate you bringing that up. No, I, I, I agree with, that, with that, your assessment on that, Jessica. I really, I, do, I really think we should look into that and, and find out if, uh, um, what some next steps might be to, 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 to do some uh, analysis like that. Sure. Um, uh, quick question came on in here uh, about the uh, security and uh, live cameras on the platforms. Yes, uh, we are working uh, with uh, Rochester Public uh, or the Rochester Police on, on, on the camera system and making sure uh, the stations will have security cameras on, on the platforms and as well as uh, emergency call buttons. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think, it feels like there's something else I'm missing there, but uh, uh, at least we'll have the cameras and the, and the emergency call buttons on, on those platforms. Uh, we do have a question came on in, uh, raise your hand um, from Barry. Uh, Alicia, if you could take the second to uh, give Barry the, the opportunity. All right, Barry, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead. Yes, uh, okay. Um, I actually have a sort of a two part question, but it's, they're short. The, um, the, when you say there's a short, uh, uh, short term impact on traffic, how short is short? Are you talking two years, three years, six months, like some kind of estimate about how long the community could expect to, to have that short term impact? And the second thing is the noise and vibration impacts. You weren't really uh, that specific. Can you be a little more specific about where that would be and what, what types of impact would involve noise and vibration and how long that would take to have that? Um, sure, I can, I can start that off. So both, well, for all traffic and noise and vibration, those would be what we call temporary impacts. So during the construction period and Adele, Jarrett, remind me how long construction is anticipated. What's the construction duration on this? Uh, we plan to start some um, some small construction work in uh, late 23, but year pretty much most all construction work will be for the, in the year of 24, 2024. Okay, so during uh, the weather pending uh, construction season of, of 2024. So um, Barry, when we talk about short-term impacts or, or temporary impacts during construction, um, there are no, that's sort of a broad statement that we know that there are going to be, like for traffic, there are going to be detours. Uh, there may be some interruptions depending where we're working within the corridor. That doesn't mean the whole corridor necessarily for the full construction season would be disrupted. I think the project is still probably working through how construction will be staged. I'm just not quite to that point yet. 
Um, same goes with noise and vibration. So um, that's referring to generally, I mean, there are going to be trucks, more trucks moving in and out of the area, maybe, you know, dump trucks, dumping materials. Um, so just different noises or more noises than, than are there today uh, that people might notice, but again, not across the whole corridor for the whole time. Uh, and similar with vibration, we look at the types of construction equipment that would be used. So if there's jackhammering or um, some other sort of heavier vibratory equipment um, that might have some other um, concerns for vibration. But again, we're not uh, anticipating, there's not a lot of heavy construction, I guess, um, happening uh, for this project. So it's sort of spread across the corridor and across time. It's not gonna be felt by everyone all the time during construction. I hope that helps. Thank you, Jessica. Um, before we move off of this slide, uh, just a, a, a quick comment from uh, the rest of the uh, facilitators and, and technical experts working on this side. Uh, just wanted to make a, point, a reminder that we will have uh, cameras on all of our buses as well uh, to, to, to look at to help monitor security. All right, uh, moving on to the next steps. Uh, Adele, are you taking these slides? Sure am. Thanks, Jarrett. So um, as we uh, just saw, the environmental process has, you know, all of these various topics and resource areas that are explored. Um, and more specifically, we are looking to uh, meet the requirement of several federal laws with the, with the environmental process. So in addition to the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, we are, are meeting the requirements of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So this is the one where Jessica was talking about the historic and cultural resources in the corridor, both architecture and archeological resources um, that we are going through a process to make sure that the project is in compliance with that law. Um, similarly, Section 4F of the Department of Transportation Act that protects parkland and parks and recreation resources and um, wildlife refuges. Um, Jessica also mentioned this one. So um, when we consider the project's impacts to parks, um, that that is our the project's way of fulfilling um, the requirements of Section 4F. And then finally, Jessica talked about the Endangered Species Act, um, so also fulfilling uh, Section 7. Section seven of the Endangered Species Act. So there's a few a few different um, federal laws kind of wrapped into this environmental process. Um, so process wise, we prepare this this document and and the the document is owned by the Federal Transit Administration. They are the federal agency that's responsible for meeting the letter of the law. And so the the city of Rochester and the project team are really preparing this document on behalf of the Federal Transit Administration. They review it. They they um, and they determine whether the project meets all their criteria for this type of environmental document, the categorical exclusion, and they confirm that, that there are no significant environmental impacts um, as a result of the project. So we, we do go through three, in three reviews with FTA of this document. So if they, on the first or second review, find that they do think there is an environmental impact, that the process is meant to be iterative. So we can come back and alter the project if we need to, to avoid or, or minimize or mitigate any impacts. So that's our process over kind of the rest of this calendar year is really gonna be focused on, on moving through that environmental process. And then, Alicia, you can go to the next slide. Um, we start to really turn our attention to um, funding and and we just talked a little bit about construction, but before we can start construction, we have to make sure that the funding for the project is all in place. Um, and the reason that we are doing a federal environmental document and working very closely with the Federal Transit Administration on this project is that the intent is that FTA is a um, funds approximately 49% of the capital cost or the construction cost of the project. And so they do that through, the FTA does that through their capital investment grant program. Um, and this is their, the, the federal government's 
primary financial resource for supporting locally driven transit capital projects like this one. Um, but before, um, according to federal law, before FTA can, can issue a grant to a project, they need to ask for a certain amount of information about the project, and then they need to determine that the project meets um, a set of criteria, both that the project itself is worthy of investment and also that the project sponsor, in this case, the city of Rochester, is in strong enough financial standing to be able to take on the project. So um, last summer, uh, the city of Rochester submitted a, an application to this grant program. And the first step is that you need to be, the project needs to be rated. And it's rated both on those project justification criteria as well as the financial criteria. And then if you get a, a rating of medium or better, it shows that the project is eligible for these capital investment grants. And we got really good news at the end of May about the project that this project was rated medium high. So it's a strong project um, in the federal uh, in the federal kind of queue of projects. Um, and then we got a second piece of good news. If we go to the next slide, uh, that not only was the project rated medium high, um, which, which keeps it in that pool of eligible projects, but the, pre uh, the president also recommended this, pro this project in the presidential budget. So what does that mean? Um, well, we, when, when we submitted this application to the FTA last year, we had to say how much we thought the project would cost to build. And then we also had to state how much, um, what size of grant we were requesting from the federal government. Um, and you can see there, we had a total project cost of 114 million in the application, and we requested $56.1 million. And essentially um, what, what FTA and what, what the, um, executive branch does is uh, they pick projects based on readiness and and merit and politics. This is this is Washington, um, uh, and and recommend a certain number of projects for funding in each fiscal year. Rochester was included in that list for fiscal year 2022, and so it's not a 100% guarantee, but it's pretty close. It's it's about as close as you, as you get really from the feds. So what they're saying is that when the project has completed the environmental review, completed NEPA, and um, once Congress has appropriated funds, so that's, that's always a little bit uncertain, um, that, and then the project finishes its requirements, the federal funding side, uh, federal funds will very likely come through. Um, and so, that's really exciting. Um, some projects will wait in the queue for several years before they get this news. And so to be in the, in the president's budget in the first year that you apply is outstanding. It's really good news for this project. Um, so uh, of course, you know, since um, it's been almost a year since that application was submitted, the, the project is cha has changed, continues to evolve as we progress through the various stages of engineering and design. And so we are, you know, progressing toward a final set of engineering drawings. There will be a final total project cost associated with that final design. And then we will um, take a look at that final cost, see how it compares to our federal allocation, and then um, enter into a grant agreement with the federal government. So um, these are, I know this is kind of bureaucratic stuff, but it's really um, important to deliver actual delivery of the project and seeing uh, that construction start on time, um, seeing the opening day in 2025, seeing the buses arrive in Rochester and start to operate on, on the streets. I think we had one more slot here for questions and we've got a few minutes left. If, any, if there are any others, I think one came in. Yes, yeah. uh, this is a great opportunity to see if anyone has any more questions before we conclude for the, for the hour. We did have one come on in um, and it was a, a question about uh, the, the current uh, Mayo West parking lot and, and the future of the Mayo West parking lot. So this one, um, so let me start off by saying the current Mayo West parking lot has, has roughly 900 parking spaces in it. Um, as part of the development of the West Transit Village, 
in total uh, on that site. Mayo is planning to construct up to 2,500 stalls as included with a parking structure um, out at that site. Um, that parking structure is not included with this project. That is a Mayo project and is not included directly with rapid transit and receiving federal funds. What is included with the rapid transit and federal funds is we're planning a, a minimum of 100 um, uh, parking spaces out at that site for the public to utilize. Um, and, and that is, once again, that is included right now with the project um, and, and the long term. Uh, let's see, Barry has one last question. If, you, uh, if Alicia, go ahead and, and unmute Barry. Barry, go ahead. Yeah, can you clarify what the topic will be at the next session that you have next month? I was headed that way, Barry. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the, the, so upcoming uh, engagement opportunities. Um, next week uh, starts, uh, returns the Thursdays downtown. Uh, the city will have a booth and myself and several of the, the project contacts and the project team uh, we'll be uh, working that city booth. So if you would like to talk to us face to face, that is an opportunity to do that. Um, next month, our next webinar will be on July 29th. And we're going to keep the same times of noon and five o'clock on the 29th. And we're going to call it virtual office hours. We did this a few months ago, but this will be, uh, we don't have, this is to say we don't have a, a direct subject that we will be uh, focusing on. Instead, we'll do a brief presentation, very brief on what the project is again, and then have an opportunity for anyone to ask questions about anything related to the project. And as you've seen over these last eight, nine months, uh, 10 months, that there's tons of different things to, to ask questions about and tons of areas that the, uh, that the rapid transit project will hit. So uh, all that to say that there is no subject for next, uh, next month's webinar, except for an opportunity to ask questions of myself and the rest of the project team. With that, uh, we'll also be back out at uh, Thursdays downtown on, on August 5th as well. With that, I, I want to say, see if there's any last questions that wanna, anyone wants to ask, either the, the, the Q&A box or by raising your hand. But, um, but I'm going to start the close down process. Once again, I should have, I'm, my apologies. I did not introduce myself. Many of you, for, I'm getting familiar with many of you. Many of you have been familiar with me through this process. My name, my name again is Jarrett Hubbard. I'm project manager for downtown rapid transit uh, out of the Office of Administration for the city of Rochester. I thank you all for attending today's session. Uh, if you're looking for more information or have additional questions outside of the webinars, as always, please visit our, our, our webpage. Uh, that's, off the, that's off of the city's webpage. Uh, but you can direct link is rochestermm.gov backslash rapid transit. And if you have any questions, uh, you can communicate via our, our email, rapid transit at rochestermm.gov, or by giving us a phone call at 507 328 2025. That's 328 2025. And once again, the email is rapid transit at rochestermm.gov. Thank you all for your time today. Um, I hope you found it in informative about what the environmental process uh, is including and will include. And we'll look into the future to uh, give you another, spend another time to, to kind of maybe finalize the environmental process with everyone uh, in the future. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Once again, website is rochestermn.gov backslash rapid transit. You go to that website. We, I believe we already have uh, a registration up already for uh, the July 29th session, if you'd like to uh, register for that. If not today or currently, it'll be up uh, hopefully by the first thing tomorrow. Appreciate, appreciate you all. Thank you. Have a good day.